So, can everybody hear me all right? Is that good sound? Great. So I will try not to be too distracted by looking at both sides of the room. I guess it is a little disoriented. Disorienting. So we're going to talk about going beyond posts and pages getting chunky. Does everybody know where the chunky reference comes from? Okay, good. We'll get to that. So blobs versus chunks is the battle, and I'm asking you today to enlist in Team Chunk. So if you're tweeting, you may actually want to take note of uh, my Twitter handle is down there. It's Jeckman. My wife actually calls me Jeckman now. It's my first initial and last name. I'm John Ekman, uh, WCDOS, you should also be using, and Chunky. And so we'll talk about what this means, but essentially what we're talking about here is content modeling and content structure. So structured content means taking big amorphous blobs and making them into smaller, finer grain chunks. Um, so as unappetizing as that metaphor may sound, that's the one we're stuck with. Um, so a little bit about me first. I uh, manage the Boston office of a company called Eyesight Design. We do uh, digital strategy development, support, maintenance, etc. So a design and technology firm. Uh, recently featured in a Forrester report on humanizing the digital experience. Uh, two thought vehicles that we produce or thought leadership uh, sites that we're behind. Uh, one is this site called Delight, delight.us, where I'll down at the bottom, uh, which is uh, a place for a tribe to gather that's interested in customer experience and companies that create delightful experiences. So the tagline, because companies that are loved win. Um, so we do a lot of posting here. We run a conference every year uh, out in Portland, Oregon, July 2013, recently concluded. Uh, that's a group of folks who are interested in this sort of notion of differentiating based on customer experience, uh, creating customer loyalty, et cetera. Speakers from companies like Zipcar and Disney and Intuit and some of the folks you would expect. Um, but lots of good videos, lots of good reports. The second, which is maybe more relevant to this talk, is the CMS myth which is a blog we've been doing for the last couple of years that's all around content management technology, content modeling, content strategy. Um, the core myth of the CMS myth is the myth that content management is a technology problem, that the solution is buying technology or writing code, when so often the solution is actually people, process, business, governance, uh, a whole bunch of million of other things, of which code is but one. So code is important, we talk a lot about technology as well, but it's one of the many things that actually that will actually influence the success or failure of your content project. The CMS is just one of those things. Right? So, quick agenda we're going to go through today. Structured content for the win. Uh, WordPress can cope. Cope is an acronym meaning create once, publish everywhere, which we'll talk about. Uh, and then what next, which is some thoughts for, for where the conversation goes from here. Um, Yes, these slides will be online. They'll actually be attached to the WordCamp site once we update the schedule, but they're also, I will tweet out a link to them. They're also on slideshare.net slash Jackman, uh, same J-E-C-K-M-A-N, it's here. Uh, and so you can find them there already, but I'll tweet the link out after the, uh, after the talk. So in the last couple of years, two major steps forward for the content strategy world and its influence on content management. One, Karen McGrain's excellent book, Content Strategy for Mobile. It's in the A Book of Heart series. It is something you should absolutely buy and read. Um, I get no commission for saying that from Karen, uh, but it's something that we have multiple copies of in the iSight Design Library. It's a book I'm fond to giving away to prospects and clients because I want them all to read it because it makes them smarter clients. Um, it's definitely worth reading. She talks a lot about the challenge of device proliferation. We've heard a couple of things already today about the device explosion. But for her, this is an opportunity to talk about what's wrong with the way we've been thinking about content management all along. So it's not just about the fact that devices have prol proliferated, but about what that revealed to us about the way we were thinking about content publishing all, all along, which has been wrong. Similar uh, story from Sarah Walker Booker's book, Content Everywhere, which is the one on the right, um, Rosenthal Media. Hers is uh, much more focused on solutions to structured content or adaptive content. So how do we, instead of thinking of the content that we create in content management systems as a big, undifferentiated mass, start to actually create content that's reusable, that's uh, structured, that's semantically understood by the system, that can be reused on different devices, in different presentation layers, et cetera. 
So she gave a talk uh, last year here in Boston at Content Strategy New England Meetup, um, and one of the major kind of takeaways from that was we don't need more content, we need content that does more. We need smarter content. We need content that's intelligent and marked up with the right metadata and has the right structure in it that we can use it in lots of contexts. Rather than the solution being write more content or write more copies of content, the solution is to actually get smarter about what we're doing. On that same uh, path, Karen's book breaks it down into these parts that are necessary to truly have adaptive content. So rather than uh, uh, sort of stupid content or content that has no markup in it, if we truly have adaptive content, it's independent of the CMS that it's in, and it's independent of its presentation. Sometimes that's a bit hard of a concept to wrap your head around, but if you think about is your content management system, your notepad, your typewriter, and your printing press all at the same time, so it's the place in which you do drafting and thinking and writing. It's the place in which you do sort of composing and page editing and page layout. And it's the thing that publishes those pages to the web. There's too much uh, leaking of that concept across all of those. So you think when you sit down to, to create new content, you think, I am writing a web page. Well, that's great as long as desktop web is the only destination that content will ever live in. What you should be thinking is, I'm making new content about a product. I'm writing a, a, a story about an event that occurred, right? The, the content itself is more important and is independent of its representation in web pages, which is why mobile becomes the thing that disrupts it. Because as soon as we started to look at our websites on those tiny little mobile devices, we said, oh, wait a minute, my content looks like crap on this device, and I need to think differently about how it's presented. What I don't want to do is have to create different presentation layers for every single device. I want to have content that can adapt, that can be smart enough to, to be used in all these different systems. So what's the difference between web publishing and content management? We have been treating CMSs, and I would include WordPress in this, in this group, but also Drupal and others, as though their job is to get content into pages on the web distinct from content management systems whose job is to structure content pardon me, independent of its presentation. So another way of parsing this, Daniel Jacobson, who was part of uh, National Public Radio when NPR went through this whole cope strategy, he's now at uh, Netflix, I believe, talks about the difference between web publishing tools and content management systems. So web publishing tools capture content with the primary purpose of publishing that content as web pages. They're very closely tied to that. The user's mentor, mental model is all about how is this going to appear on the web page. Their styling and content go hand in hand. There's no separation of the sort of, a clean separation of the metadata from the thing. And you will recognize that you think this way if you're thinking of creating content as I need to impact that web page on the site. I need to change that content on that page. You're not thinking about all of the other places that that content might be used or consumed. You're thinking about its, its presentation as opposed to CMSs, which are intended to store the content cleanly, enabling the presentation layers to think about how to display that content. And we'll have some examples as we go. So this is what we call WordPress blobs. So Karen's book, which I just highly recommended, and she's an incredibly smart person, takes WordPress as the bad example. It takes WordPress as the sort of whipping boy of what she calls blobs. And what she's talking about is this kind of interface. So this is the Zen-free Zen writing mode or destruction free writing mode. Uh, one of Matt Mullenweg's favorite features of this 3.5 when it came out. Um, very much a focus on just you are writing, you have your WYSIWYG editor, and all of the content that you write ends up getting dumped into the database in this big, what she calls, blob of content. Right? So all the HTML is mixed in together, all the references to images. It's all, if you think from a like classical data modeling or database normalization schema kind of way of thinking about the world, it's all just one big blob, right? And that's what she means by blobs versus chunks. The reality is, and, and, and the inspiration for this presentation originally was actually reading Karen's book and going, you're so right about content modeling, you're so right about content strategy, you're so right about what we want to do, but you're so wrong about WordPress because you're, you're, if you're using it as a straw man, because WordPress actually can be chunky. It actually does break things into chunk. So yes, by default, you've got this big, giant body field. And yes, by default, people tend to put a lot of stuff in there that doesn't necessarily belong in there. But you also do have some metadata, right? So by default, we've got a title that's distinct from the body. 
we've got an excerpt, we've got categories, we've got tags, we have versions, we have lots of different ways of categorizing, even by default, the things that are related to this content. More to the point, WordPress is not just a site factory and a blog platform, it's an extensible open platform that provides a ton of APIs that enable you to make it richer. Right? So you can, in fact, make that strategy stronger. So COPE, as I mentioned earlier, is the NPR case study, create once, publish everywhere, get structured content into the system in the right way with the right structure so that it can then be used through multiple APIs, through multiple different applications in multiple contexts. There's a fantastic slide share uh, that Zach Brand did. Zach is the guy who followed Daniel Jacobson at NPR and updated the, the API. But this is an example of their story entry screen. And what's important about their story entry screen is they don't just have this one teaser page. There's a teaser, a mini teaser, there's a title, there's a shorter title, there's a display date, an updated date, a page type. There's, this actually goes on at some length. Um, you need multiple different teasers for different contexts, you need different titles for different contexts. You have 14 different crop sizes and shapes for every image so that some are appropriate for use in a thumbnail and some are appropriate for use on desktop web and some are appropriate for mobile. And they're all stored in the system in a very organized and structured fashion, right? So they're not just blobbed together into one giant chunk of HTML, but they're actually spread out. So my argument was we can make WordPress chunkier, right? It does not have to store blobs in the database. There's actually a lot you can do to customize WordPress to make it more chunky. So what do we do? Custom post types, custom taxonomies, and custom metadata. These are all features that have evolved into WordPress over the last several years. Um, taxonomies goes back, I think, the longest of the three, but all of these are things that have been enabled in WordPress for a long time and let you create a WordPress system that can do what NPR described as code, right? So you can structure the data that you're inputting into the system in a more fundamental level so that you get out of blobs and into chunks. Wouldn't custom fields also belong in So I th it depends on what you mean by custom fields. I think of that as custom metadata. So metadata, post meta that you're attaching to posts could fall into this list as well. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sorry, so she was asking about custom fields. And I think by custom fields you mean what I think of as custom metadata, which is to say post-meta fields that get stored along with an item. What's interesting isn't just each of these in isolation, but the way in which you can play them together, right? So you can take a custom post type, attach a custom taxonomy to it, and attach custom metadata to that post type and that taxonomy. You can get some very interesting uh, results. So quick example of custom post types. We all use custom post types before. Do you know if you've used custom post types before? Because you may not know. So some custom post types get enabled by plugins. That's how I think most users first encounter the notion of custom post types. So they, they install some kind of plugin and they get this new entry in the menu on, on one side. Where you have posts, media, pages, those are all, and comments, those are all default uh, uh, post types in WordPress. But now all of a sudden I have this alerts tab. So this is a plugin that I wrote for a nonprofit that I work with that just uses their, uses custom post types as a way to display their newsletter, which they call alerts, which they send out monthly. So I get the new addition to the menu. I also get a new uh, thing into the uh, new post screen, which basically says, now what I'm creating isn't just a post or a page, it's an alert. This could be a press release, this could be a, a email newsletter, a bunch of different things that it could be. The point is that when I'm creating it, I'm thinking differently, and so this is how it ends up being displayed. Um, there's nothing terribly fancy about this custom post type, except that I'm sorting it, using, sorting it and using the date in a different fashion than the blog. But, how do I accomplish this? So uh, I did warn there would be a little bit of code in this talk. But so register post type is the core function that I use. Uh, this can be done in a plugin or in a theme. I'll come back to that confusion later because that's actually one of the places where this gets a little confusing in the WordPress world is that is the creation of a custom content type something that really belongs to the plugin and programming side of the world or is it something that really belongs in the theme and, and uh, presentation tier side of the world? If a custom post type is really designed to get a structured content that's presentation independent, it shouldn't really probably be in the theme, which is meant to be about presentation, but this is one of the places where our abstractions get a little leaky and we get some overlap, and that's okay. But so what I can decide is what to call it, where to show it, and I mean where to show it both in terms of the admin interface and in terms of the uh, end users and where they will see it. 
uh, who can use it and what it includes. And so there's actually a, a huge amount of flexibility here. Um, people underestimate kind of the flexibility that this API offers. But essentially I'm saying, I'm going to create a post type, this is my function, I'm going to register a post type, and I give it uh, some names. And, and again, you don't have to understand the code, it'll be in the slides, and there's lots of great examples, uh, tutorials around the web. Another example slides, this is a plugin called Meteor Slides, which I did not write, I'm just using it as an example. Uh, again, it's a custom post type which lets me create new slideshows and put slides into them and rearrange them and they're separate from posts and pages. They can move to posts and pages but they're their own content type. Again, it's a little on the edge because we're doing this in order to create a slideshow. So it's actually sort of another very presentation tied way of doing a content type but it uses this function and, and does most of the same. They are using way more of the options. so. Uh, skip through all of them, but so you can define even what kind of icon you want to show up in the menu next to it where people are creating it. You can determine whether or not it has an archive, so there's a way to get to an archive of those post types. You can determine whether it's included in search. You can set your own set of capabilities, so just as in WordPress roles you can determine different roles have different capabilities, you can set up your own capabilities for who gets to edit this content type. Um, it's really a, a full-blown way of letting uh, developers create custom content types that are neither just pages nor just posts, but are something entirely different, right? And it lets you actually do content modeling. There's been actually a couple of talks already today that have talked about uh, custom post types. Um, so it feels to me like a kind of feature that uh, came into WordPress around 2.9 and then uh, some additional functionality got added in 3.0 that people are just now kind of figuring out what all the value in custom post types are. A lot of the kind of projects that like Stephen Ward was talking about in his talk earlier today around WP Invoice or WP Project Management or a lot of these kind of web apps that are based on WordPress actually end up using custom post types pretty extensively to create their whole kind of um, experience. Those are plugins. Uh, there are web apps that are created by installing a plugin on top of WordPress. Um, so the plugin in that case is what's creating the custom post type. Um, themes can also create custom post types. Um, so a lot of times where you'll see this is you install a theme, for example, for an artist site and there's a portfolio and creating items in the portfolio that aren't actually posts or pages, usually it's because that theme has to find a custom post type for portfolio items um, and given it appropriate names and metadata. So taxonomies. So uh, taxonomy is uh, like genus, phylum, kingdom, and species in the animal world, that a taxonomy is a way of grouping and sorting and identifying things. In a WordPress context, you're most familiar with taxonomy from categories and tags, right? Categories of posts are part of taxonomy, but you can define a custom taxonomy. So in this case, this is from a site um, that I built for Generation Citizen, which is another local nonprofit. Um, we defined a custom post type for stories, and then each of those stories also has a custom taxonomy for locations and topics, um, which are ways of sorting the stories. So Generation Citizen sends volunteer uh, uh, civic students from college into local high schools to teach kids about civics through actual direct action. So they learn how to solve problems in their local community, and that increases their voting rights later when they become adults, a way of kind of encouraging more democratic participation. So these stories all occur in certain locations and have certain topics. And enabling that custom taxonomy then lets you set up, as people create new stories, they get to choose which uh, locations and topics those stories belong to. So your custom content type can also then have a custom taxonomy that's different than categories you use elsewhere. So the canonical example that people often use is, is wine or music. So you're creating different wines, you want to put those wines in different categories by what varietal they are, you're creating bands, you want to put those bands in different categories based on what kind of genre of music. You can create custom taxonomies that go along with your custom post types. Um, again, uh, as you might suspect in uh, WordPress, there's a function, register taxonomy, which takes a bunch of arguments. Those arguments, again, have to do with their names and their activities as well as whether they have a tag cloud, whether there's an admin column when you're looking at the custom post type, you can see what, what taxonomy it's in. There's a bunch of other things you can do. In order to get those custom taxonomies to show up, you are adding meta boxes, which will actually show up on the admin page. 
and then you're passing them a styling function. Again, you don't need to follow all of the code to understand, but basically what you're doing is saying, this post has registered a certain kind of taxonomy. When someone is editing this kind of content item, you need to show that taxonomy so that they can select it. And then when they save that kind of content item, you need to set the appropriate metadata on the back end. So the last part is custom metadata. So in addition to those taxonomies, this is where custom fields comes in. You can say, along with the topic and location, there are these sort of freeform extra fields that we need to know for our Generation Citizen story site. We need to know who the teacher was and what school they were in and what democracy coaches, and we have a full quote. All of these are just extra fields that are getting attached to this content type. So that by the time I'm done and I'm displaying a story, I can lay out on the page in all kinds of different ways this information. So the system knows this part, right? I could just write all these in the, the standard post editor and, and have them put school colon and name the school and have them put teacher and name the teacher and have them write all of that directly into the post. But once the system has it structured, then I can do all kinds of things like show me all of the stories that are about this school or about this teacher or in this location or for this topic. Or I can let you page through uh, lists of the various schools that have been used in any of these custom content types. So I can present kind of a list of all of the teachers that have been involved. It lets me act on that data in a more meaningful fashion. So post meta boxes like the taxonomy ones, uh, use a couple of different WordPress functions to enable them. Add meta boxes takes a styling function, the style function outputs it, and there's a save and update uh, to save the data that was input into the form. So that's the sort of code way. You've got custom post types, you've got taxonomies you can assign to them, and you have custom fields or custom metadata. That would let you accomplish a lot of the kind of structure that NPR Cope established that lets you say, I'm modeling a different kind of data. I'm not just writing posts. I'm creating products for my website. And a product is a custom post type, and a product lives in a couple of categories. And a product has certain kinds of fields that are associated with it. Question? Do you need to use PHP to dictate? Oh, sorry. Do you need to use PHP to dictate where it appears on the page? So I'll just repeat the question because it might not work. Do you need to use PHP to dictate where it appears on the page? PHP will be involved in where it appears on the page. Whether you need to use some or not is actually where I'm headed next, right? So uh, this is WordPress. We don't need to write code. There are plugins that do a lot of this. So the, the short answer is somewhere along the way, somebody is writing some PHP code to determine where all this data appears on the page. In general, uh, that involves your theme, and it involves choices in your theme about where you're going to output those fields. There are a couple of exceptions. Custom post types themselves, by default, when you define them or when you use a plugin that defines them, um, can have default templates that come from WordPress that will that, that will display the list of those custom post types and the, the individual custom post types, so your team may already support that. Um, often, a plugin or a theme that leverages custom post types will have already made those decisions about where that content is displaying. But the flip side of that is to really get the full value of this whole COPE strategy, you may have multiple different front ends that are pulling this data, and in that case, you're, somebody is absolutely writing some code, right? This is not um, 101 stuff. There's, there's definitely some effort involved. Um, but so I'll just briefly talk about sort of how to get chunky via plugins, which was one of the alternate titles I had for this talk. Um, so the first two are sort of, I think, the most important um, custom post type UI. Uh, is a plugin that came out around the same time that custom post types were introduced. That uh, its version is marked 0.8.1 right now, but don't be frightened away from that if you're the kind of person who usually only looks for version 2 of something. Even though it's 0.8.1, it's a fairly mature plugin at this point. It's gone through a lot of development effort. Um, and what that does is add a menu to your site that lets you define custom post types uh, and custom taxonomies uh, in a more WordPress admin friendly kind of way, right? So you're actually in the admin doing the kind of admin work you normally do. Um, and then you will still have some theme to do to figure out where those are, are displayed, again, unless your regular uh, just single.php, your normal single page template actually works for that content type. Um, but then custom post type list short code actually lets you also output various kinds of lists of these custom post types and actually has some nice theme built into it that is less scary than other PHP. 
secondary HTML content actually will require you to write some PHP to effectively use it, but lets you attach secondary HTML areas to a uh, custom content type or even to one of the existing content types. Um, and so you can have kind of, uh, in the Generation Citizen uh, example, each of those stories actually has major sections, um, topics, root causes, identified outcomes, goals, and each of those sections is actually a discrete HTML entry area in the interface, so they're all actually separate. They're not just rolled up into the, the, the main uh, body content and that's secondary HTML. Attachments is a nice way of actually having file attachments to custom post types. So if there's a PDF that's the data sheet for each product, um, you can use attachments and it adds a nice little attach box and then a nice little short code you can use to output where the attachments come out. Uh, so here's what custom post types UI does. Um, this again lets you create the custom post type via its label, and it does a very nice job of sort of keeping all the advanced options present but hiding them by default in a very WordPress appropriate way. Um, and then it also lets you do the same thing for taxonomies. So you can create taxonomies and attach them to various types um, without uh, doing a whole lot of coding. So, where does WordPress run into trouble? So I've said it's this fantastic, extensible framework. There's all kinds of things you can do to create custom post types and metaboxes and taxonomy, and you can replicate absolutely everything that's in the giant NPR code uh, entry form with 36 different fields for each type. Um, I'm not sure I would want to do that, but that's a whole longer story. You could create all of that. Where does it run into trouble? Well, relationships between content types. So we call these custom post types um, because of WordPress legacy. Really, I should think of them as custom content types. But the fact is that one of the things that's often really important when you're creating custom content types is that they have relationships to each other, right? So post uh, uh, products are in a certain category with other products. Um, you have, uh, in the music example, albums that are by a band, but they're also in a genre, but that band also has relationships to other people who are in the band. And all of those relationships are meaningful. WordPress, uh, there's in uh, the core track, and the URL here is down here at the bottom. This is 10657, my favorite WordPress core track number. So this is the request to allow many to many relationships between, it originally was posted attachments, it's later in the thread sort of broadened out to, to, to wider things. And it's closed as a maybe later. In other words, the core team has said, we don't think this should be a part of the core platform. This is plugin territory. So there are some plugins that do this. Post to Post is the most well known, but there's also Post Relationships. There are ways in which you can sort of, uh, fake is probably too strong a word, work around and create the appearance of things being related to each other. You can create custom taxonomies uh, that are hidden in the background. And when somebody saves a, a content type of that type, you actually create a custom post type of that taxonomy to assign it to in the background on the post submit hook. So there's some ways in which you can make this happen, but as compared to other CMSs, this is definitely a place where like Drupal developers who dive into WordPress get to this point and go, what do you mean there's no uh, node reference type? Why can't I just say this is related to that? And you say, well, because we need to get the six five seven. Uh, and so this is a place where there's some disagreement and argument in the community about what to do, but uh, we will figure it out. So back to the question of display of custom post types. So by default, in your theme, you will have a file likely called archive.php and a file called single.php. WordPress will go through its template hierarchy and it will look for a file called single-posttype.php, so single-alert, for example, in the alerts case. If it finds that, it will use that as a way of displaying the items of type <coughs> alert. If it doesn't, it will fall back to the existing single.php. So you'll kind of get this behavior where if you've created a very custom template, it'll be used, and if you haven't, it, it'll fall back to some kind of same default. Um, so often I find in various kinds of themes, you can take, uh, like there's a plugin called Press News and Events that creates a, a custom content type for press releases. And in most themes, you can drop that right into your theme and just use it as is, because you already have some kind of an archive.php file that's designed for your blog archives, and it ends up working very well. Uh, but if you want to make changes, that's where you would make changes. So ultimately, though, to really leverage the sort of full flexibility 
you will need to do custom theming, and the real power ends up coming when you go beyond the WordPress theme altogether. So there have been a couple of sessions today. There was a, a workshop on Friday about Timber, which is a, a theming uh, framework. Uh, Timber is used in a number of other contexts, including uh, AAA. But it's a different way of creating themes, and you can actually specify at a very granular level how the different information that might be available gets displayed in themes. And when you combine this with custom post types and taxonomy and metadata, you can get a very kind of rich theming experience. There's also, uh, and uh, Kate Adam White actually gave another version of this talk earlier today about JavaScript and Backbone.js. Again, it's a little developer-centric, so uh, the non-developers in the room might be a bit frightened by it, but it's basically a way of saying, now we've used WordPress to be our content entry engine, we've used it as our content modeling system, we've defined a, a sort of strict hierarchy and data model of what this content looks like, but now to display it, we can use all kinds of different technologies. So we can use backbone.js and call the JSON API, we can build a mobile app, and we can build all kinds of different things, all pointing back at the data that lives in WordPress in a structured fashion. But we could create five different ways of presenting that same data. Right? We, we get out of this kind of connection between the way the data is stored and the way it's displayed, and we get more flexibility. Um, a lot of folks have been starting to use that JSON API and create multiple different ways to pull content out of WordPress and use it in different contexts. You don't have to just think WordPress's job is to display the blog pages. WordPress can be used as the sort of back end of many different kinds of presentation models. Uh, and so when we finally get there, we'll have achieved this kind of model that NPR uses, um, and we'll have achieved some degree of data independence. And so with that, questions? and questions. <laughs> She's asking about custom post types reorder. It, it works uh, for your cases. It, um, you know, the question of reordering in general, it, it's funny, so uh, Jake Old actually gave a talk earlier today, top 10 questions I ask every WordPress developer interview. And one of the questions he asks them is, what's the part of WordPress that you don't think works exactly right? I would say post ordering is one of those places where there could be some improvement. So in general, post ordering plugins work but then you can run into edge cases where your uh, ordering isn't what other things expect, so there's no kind of unified way to say, this is how I always want that order to work, because there are lots of different opportunities to override the query and make changes. It can be, um, so yes, it's a good plugin, but it won't necessarily work in all cases. Something better might come out. Something better might come out if we get some better APIs. I don't, it's, it, that's not a criticism of the author of, of that plugin, it's a criticism of sort of what mechanisms they have available to do what they're trying to do. Go in the back first, and then we'll come up here. Oh, you have a mic, so we'll go there. Sorry. Uh, can you go back to, you, you talked about um, the custom post and that taxonomy. Uh -huh. At the level of the theme versus WordPress, I mean, shouldn't they not be in a theme so that when you change theme, you still have them? Yes, that would be my argument. So the, the point that I was making was when you're defining, you know, WordPress, uh, and this is kind of, it's, place in a historical evolution as a content management system, allows custom post types to be created in the functions.php in a theme or in a plugin. If your custom post types are defined by your theme and you spend a bunch of time writing a bunch of content that's in that custom post type and then you change to a theme that doesn't know anything about that custom post type, there's no way to display them, right? Now, that's not really fair because you could write a plugin that knows about just the part of the custom post type, right? You could go into the functions.php and the theme that you were using and take all that stuff out and dump it into a plugin and you could get around that problem. But it's it's sort of reflective of the larger issue, which is we as a, as a community haven't really decided, are these custom post types just ways of getting certain kinds of content to display a certain way on the page, which is the theming function? Or are they truly sort of data modeling tools, in which case they're all about the database and they shouldn't know anything about the theme. Though at some level, the theme has to know they exist to be able to display them, so there is a kind of trade-off. Um, I think the way the template hierarchy handles it is actually a great model, um, but there isn't a way for the template hierarchy to know about all the custom meta that you might have, right? So it's a little bit tricky. 
it would be nice if there were some very generic functions for displaying all the metadata associated with a given content type that could sort of hint to themes what they need to know, but um, that's uh, you know, more about how the API evolves. Yeah. I was thinking about I'm not familiar with it, so she was asking if the mic wasn't working about tool set types and views. Yes, or and custom types and types on I am not familiar with it. I, I, all the custom post type work I've done has actually been directly in code. Um, I like to code. Um, anybody else familiar with custom tool sets types? Yeah? I use it all the time, love it. Okay, a positive recommendation, use it all the time, no, love it. Um, I use it frequently. Um, I like it, it's easier for non-developers to use. It follows, it's basically a, provides a graphical user interface for what the codex describes as possible stuff. So if you read the codex and follow along in the UI, you can pretty much do anything you want with custom post type without writing any code. Like okay. And does it provide sort of features in terms of how that gets displayed? Yeah, it lets you uh, create views that use the custom post types and fields you've defined and allows you to filter them, creates forms and different ways to display them, and also you can attach custom CSS, HTML, and JavaScript to the right okay. interface. Great, so yeah, we talked about do you need to write PHP to control how they display? And I said somebody is, and that's probably not true because somebody might be writing just CSS and JavaScript and HTML that just controls how they display, and, and that plugin may be a good way to, to do that. I'll have to add it to my resources list. Custom tool set types and views. It's, uh, they just changed, um, it used to be called, they just changed the name of it a few months ago. I think it's called tool set. Um, I'll have to Google it. Just, uh, it's one of the sponsors. Oh, yes, they are. Uh, Is it that's a good point. Yeah, it's the one that's TVC tool set. That's what I get for being an uninvolved organizer this year. I don't even know who sponsors yeah. them. Please visit all of our sponsors. I love them. Yeah, I know. I do. They are all great. I wish I had Just a quick comment. Yeah. Um, we were talking about the solution. We were talking about the, the solution uh, between uh, whether or not custom post types or something that live inside of the theme yep. or otherwise. I've done work with Boston Magazine and uh -huh. Philly Mag and whatnot, and they work with Kenop in right. order to do it. And Kenop is a very strict and very specific way that they right. want to have things mess with when it comes to their theme. So when creating, like, for Boss Mag, the, the shoes we wore, uh -huh. uh, which was uh, for the Boston Jericho Bums, we basically wrote all of our code to create the custom post type for it and then had to wrap it up yeah. as a plugin. Right. Such that the theme did in fact know that it existed because we did a check for it, but after that, it really was all of right. So with the right, it's less of a challenge for like for an individual site. It's more if you're trying to write a theme that lots of that 100 different sites can use, or you're writing a plugin that's going to be used on 100 different sites. As long as your development team is talking to each other, you can put some of it over here as a plugin and some of it over here as a theme, and, and, and it all works and it's fantastic. I mean, it's really a truly extensible system. The challenge is when you're trying to write plugins for a general audience, or you're trying to write themes for a general audience, somewhere. either you bundle them together, which is the more common approach, which is the theme creates a bunch of custom post types, or you create a custom post type plugin and provide a bunch of documentation about how to add it to your theme, which is the other approach people take. Sometimes even a short code that can put the right stuff into the theme, but um, more often than not, it's sort of take this PHP snippet and put it in your theme here, copy this uh, single dash portfolio.php into your theme, right? It, it's, there's still a little bit of a, a sort of unclean abstraction. Um, and, and that doesn't, it doesn't prevent successful work from happening. It just makes it a little harder to do it repeatedly and in a kind of by convention fashion, right? You have to kind of, you know how Tenup wants it to work and they know how you want your theme to work and that's why it all. Well, you have to have this, which is abstracting information, the custom post type, inside of the theme is technical debt because at the end of the day, if you know, Metroport decides that they want to use a totally different theme for a particular portion of their site because they're running multi-site, uh, and they, they switch that up, suddenly they've lost access to all that. But if the custom post type is in a plugin 
then you can still call that data through things like the JSON API and through other mechanisms without having to invoke the data, which is really the philosophy. Great. So we are at time. Thanks all. Thank